members of the General Council, Executive Council. Um, I want to especially welcome Professor uh, Don Marshall to the Democratic Labour Party. I know, of course, Professor has um, visited us before. Of course, he's an impartial uh, friend of the Democratic Labour Party. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I want to welcome all you all to the Astor B. Watts Lunchtime Lectures. Um, this initiative, of course, uh, was uh, resuscitated and infused with some life over the last uh, number of weeks. We put a committee in place, headed up by Comrade uh, Paul Gibson, and of course, um, assisted by our Comrade René Demotte and a, a group of a committee members to ensure that the life of this lecture series continues. And I want to especially thank those members of that committee for acceding to the request of President Ronnie for resuscitating and infusing life back into this, this series. <laughs> of course, this series is done, this series of lectures, uh, it's done, of course, in collaboration with the James Schroeder Institute of Politics, which you will hear uh, quite a bit about as we go forward, because it is a collaborative effort between these two in internal institutions of the party to educate, enlighten, and inform not only the general membership of the Democratic Labour Party, but the wider public. So we're happy that these two institutes or these two um, uh, organs of the Democratic Labour Party is coming back to life. So it is my duty, of course, this uh, afternoon to welcome you and before I invite uh, Comrade Renat Demont to introduce our guest speaker. I will invite um, Comrade Dr. David Durant to invoke God's blessings on the proceedings. Again, welcome to the Astor B. Watts Lunchtime Lecture. Thank you, Mr. President, former. I want us to stand, please. As we just ask God's presence in the proceedings. Father and God, we take time out to say thanks to you. Thank you for life. Thank you that we are here yet another day. And we don't take life for granted. We know, Lord, we can do nothing without you, and the very breath we breathe lies in your hands. So thank you for everyone gathered here today. Thank you for the president. Thank you for Professor Don Marshall, who has accepted the request to be here. And we pray for all that you will share today that will be a source of inspiration, information, as well as education. Pray for our nation that you will visit us in a very special way. We ask for your divine intervention in our land, our island Barbados. And we pray that you will continue to lead and direct and guide the affairs of this nation. We see you as Lord, and we honor you as such. Bless the proceedings today in this lunchtime lecture. And we pray, Father, at the end of it, we be encouraged and inspired. And there'll be some action plans that we can implement and move it to see better in the, our nation. We ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and the blessed Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Be seated.
Good afternoon, all. It is so wonderful to see all of you here today. Thanks for making a special effort to attend. Protocol has already been established. However, kindly join me in welcoming and acknowledging our esteemed guest speaker for today's lecture entitled, The State We Are In, by Professor Don Marshall. He has a distinguished career in social and economic affairs. Professor Don Marshall received a Bachelor of Arts degree in the History and Political Science and a Master of Philosophy in Political Science from the University of the West Indies Cafe Campus in 1991 and 1993, respectively. He continued his education at the University of Newcastle in United Kingdom, where he successfully achieved a doctorate in international political economy in 1986. 96. <laughs> it's good that you're listening. He began his academic career at Cave Hill Campus in 1996 in the Department of Government, Sociology, and Social Work as a temporary lecturer before being appointed a research fellow at the renowned Institute of Social and Economics Research, later renamed the Sir Arthur Institute of Social and Economic Studies, acronym SILESIS. Professor Marshall has authored the following books, Caribbean Political Economy at the Crossroads and Regional Developmentalism. He has also co-edited two other books, The Empowering, the Empowering Impulse, The Nationalist Tradition of Barbados, and Living at the Borderlines, Issues in Caribbean Sovereignty and Development. He has written several books, chapters, co-written eight monographs, and is the author of several articles in leading academic journals. Over the last 15 years, he has made a considerable contribution in the area of global financial governance. He is critically examined the role of Caribbean international financial centers in the global geography of financial services provision. Throughout his years at KFL campus, Professor Marshall has been actively involved in teaching, curriculum development, and editing academic publications. He was a member of the Silesis Working Committee that designed the Motor Campus Base, MSc Development Policy Programs, and Course Offerings. He was also one of the four scholars who revised and designed several core courses for the MSc in Developmental Studies. His public service contribution to Barbados has been very prolific. He has served on numerous boards. He was a member of the Economic Advisory Council to Government of Barbados, member of the Inter-American Development Bank and Caribbean Civil Society Action Group, member of the CARICOM Task Force examining the international regulation and compliance demands on Caribbean finance and international business sectors. Member of the Caribbean Community CARICOM Results-Based Management Leadership Team. Chairman of the Barbados Industrial Development Corporation and the Barbados Agricultural Management Company. He is a current member of the UWI COVID-19 Task Force at the Cavill Campus. The Academic History Liaison Committee and is aimed at bridging the gap between academia and the private sector. He's the father of two children, Nia Marshall and Johannes Dijon Marshall. Professor Marshall has a special interest in sports, primary, primarily cricket and road tennis. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Don Marshall. Thank you very much for your kind words. <laughs> and um, thank you very much to the members of the committee, uh, the Asta Watts committee, 
I also want to pay tribute as well to the framers, organizers of the James Tudor Institute for Politics. I also want to pay tribute to and thanks, special thanks to the leader of the Democratic Labour Party, current leader, in Dr. Ronnie Yearwood. I also want to thank you for coming out in your numbers. And uh, I hope that the volume levels are good enough for the media to hear me properly. And I hope that the scribes in the media do get me right today. Um, I, I cannot chase down every time I'm being misquoted. <laughs> so there's a lot of good things the press have written that adequately capture what I say. And there are lots of things that were not well captured. So people have all kinds of perceptions about me. Um, because I don't, I have not, to my um, my own feeling, I've not always chased down everything that was reproducing the press with inverted marks, inverted commas that I never did say. Um, my thing is that as a public intellectual, I will always get an opportunity to come back and speak. So I I, I see it as something that um, if I can live with it. Even as a mistake, I will live with it, um, and so on and so forth. I like the term that Steve used. <laughs> he referred to me as, I want to capture that, well, impartial friend of the, <laughs> of the Democratic Labour Party. And um, I would like to think that I'm an impartial friend of various civil society organizations, including political parties and um, and the impartial bit is that I uh, my mother taught me to speak up and speak out as, as long as you have a voice so so um, I have friends in the Democratic Labour Party that heard me speak out during their tenure and um, Fortunately, I can say that I have never had to rely on any political party in Barbados for what I do. At the same time, I generally acknowledge the role that political parties play as representatives of the people. And so the taxpayer support that I love for my education and journey to this point is something that I pay tribute to Barbadians, residents, and the two alternating parties in government because they've kept the education flag flying. Without which I would not be here standing and daring to muse out loud about the state we're in. Now I know that that title is deliberately provocative and so on. And I, I don't intend to bore you at least that's not my intention. But my intention is to just make sure we rise above the din of everyday discourse about where we are and where we want to be. And I, I think that I'll be doing justice to the founders of the James Tudor Institute of Politics and to the new leadership of the Democratic Labour Party if I take seriously the claim that we need to engage in ideas, uh, ideas exchange. So what I'm going to do is just, in layman's language, try my best to put across what really are some of the challenges that we face. I want to map a vision or reimagine where we would be in say 2035 and a roadmap for how we get there. But to do so, I want to say to you that back about 20 years ago, I made a, a modest contribution to a raging debate going on on the scholarly pages of journals and um, books about what kind and what type of state is required 
to ensure long run growth, long run development. It was in 20, 2002 when I wrote an article that appeared, a scholarly piece that appeared in the journal Third World Quarterly, Journal of Emerging Areas. Um, it was entitled, At Who Service? Caribbean State Posture, Merchant Capital, and the Export Services Option. At Who Service? Caribbean State Posture, Merchant Capital, and the Export Services Option. I was intervening in a debate at the time, both at the level of journals and academia, and live on the ground in relation to development practices in the Caribbean, particularly in Barbados, on what kind of state. And during that time, there was a lot of panel beating around the need for Barbados to contemplate being a services-driven economy and the rest of it. And I thought that I could reflect a little bit more on what, what this actually meant and how do we achieve key goals to do with who we are. And um, as a political scientist trained in international political economy, it means that sometimes I may adopt the speech habits of an economist, but I'm trained to um, ask the who benefits question and to ask certain kinds of questions about the founding principles and ideas governing those thoughts and those policies. So you're not going to find me producing growth models and engaging in you know, this parsing of words around which growth model is the best one. So ultimately back then I was asking about the role that the state should play in encouraging a development that was beyond the limited diversification model that we were operating within. Put simply, Barbados' economy for a long time has been chugging along on the basis of um, dynamism in the international business and finance sector and on tourism. And at the time, the, the attitude was let services rip. That industrial development processes and so on, the question of food sovereignty, food security, these are matters that in an economy that was approaching a $8 billion economy, consumers will be able eventually to buy buy the food they need and consume and realize who they are as consumers. And um, at the time, the then Prime Minister would have given a speech that in private discourse after, he would tell me it was a fit of rhetorical excess, uh, where he says that the land fetch its highest value. And those are the days when he was talking about not so much about agricultural development per se, but about um, expanding the scope for real estate prospecting, golf courses, villas, etc. That if you really leave it to market forces, this is where investors are headed. They're they're heading to Barbados, interested in buying up properties, uh, interested in real estate prospecting. Of course, 166 square miles and so on, and a high demand for a piece of the rock, you know that there was always going to be a, a point in which that strategy could not be sustained. However, insofar as private capital flows were flowing in, and insofar as the public discussion was about allowing foreign investment to take root, there was no scope for a debate that asks after the character and orientation of investment. We don't ask these things routinely in the media. We just are satisfied to talk about foreign investment. But you have to ask, what is the character and orientation of that foreign investment? Will it take Barbados developmentally forward? Or will it re-entrench and consolidate 
the merchant capitalist bias of the economy. When I say merchant capitalist bias, bias, we live in a land where commerce dominates production. We live in a land of buying and selling, import trading, real estate prospecting, insurance, banking, finance, what in the literature is referred to as the circulation of commerce, not production. Production is about import substitution replacement, it's about manufacture, it's about design, it's about all the good work that Mark Hill, the CEO of um, the BADC, um, is trying to do and trying to achieve in rebranding and pushing the export uh, export impetus. So I hope the media gets that right. I hope the media recognizes that I'm signaling out the BADC as a government agency that is under the leadership of Mark Hill uh, making the right kinds of moves that we need to make in terms of export thrust. I'll come back to the export thrust in a minute. But back in the day, 2002, you know, as I'm speaking about the time when I first wrote this, this piece, uh, the prevailing thought at the time was that, look, um, allow the market set to, I'm sorry, allow market forces to determine the rate of growth of Barbados and the sustainable path that we will pursue, because after all, Canada was still our main um, source market for international business. Uh, at the time, tourism receipts were pretty good, and there was no complaint about the phenomenon of tourists coming in their numbers but not spending. They were actually spending. So short of a, a momentary recession that we had in 2001 when we had an 11 event, 2002, three onwards, there was a rebounding of the Barbados and regional economy and so on. And we could for, um, forego or postpone or ignore persons who ask deeper questions about the nature of the investments that we were attracting. Uh, the West Coast was being bought up. Um, but the concern was at the time that any attempt to criticize that really is an anti-foreign investment posture when really that was not the case. So on the pages of that journal, I was engaging in a discussion, debate, at the time about the role of the developmental state and about seizing what, what I call structural opportunities Basically, in the international political economy, if I could just explain what I mean by structural development opportunities, if you take a long-run view of historical capitalism, you see the rise and fall of states. You see the rise and fall of regions. You ask the question, how did some countries develop and others not develop? How did countries that were once developed slip? Uh, in the, in, the, in the hierarchy, uh, in, the, in, the, in the world system pyramid, as it were. How do, how do societies transform to produce that long-run long development and so on? And all those long-run development episodes outside of a treatment of imperialist countries all those long run episodes, development episodes, were based on elites or state managers recognizing an opportunity and pursuing that opportunity. So don't get me wrong, I am not really talking about core states that use imperialism and plunder to get where they are today. I'm not talking about those countries. I'm talking about uh, for purposes here, I'm talking about the rise of East Asian countries and some way to Southeast Asia. And at the time, the literature was replete with discussions about what accounts for the success of these industrializing countries. And here in the Caribbean, there was a, there was an, I had established a critical tradition, a critical development theory tradition Robert, um, people like um, George Beckford, 
Lloyd Bess, and we come right through to to um, Neville Duncan and others who all wrote and contributed to debates about uh, development and underdevelopment. And they were all part of this discussion about what kind of state we need to push past limited diversification or limited development, what kind of state we need for long run successful development episodes, okay, or sustainable development. And of course, in Asia, scholars reviewing the, the Asian, Asian countries pointed to a number of local factors, but they did highlight the importance of geopolitics and uh, the importance of um, the international developments that would have seen some of these countries transform and the governments therein seizing those opportunities. And the recurring theme was that the state play a starring role, a leading role in seizing those opportunities. Uh, for those in Latin America, those were all pribish, um, people that I had an opportunity to meet with when I was doing my PhD, like Andrew Gunder Frank, he had a big influence on me. Um, you see, in 1967, he had written a book called Development of Underdevelopment that inspired a lot of work. By the time I was seeing him, he was a wrinkled, 78 year old man doing a scholarly residence at the university I attended. And he was repudiating a lot of things that he had written earlier. So I met him at an interesting time in his life where, he, yes, he agreed that you are underdeveloped Africa. And yes, he, he, he kept that thesis, but he also felt that it was important to look at what state elites do when they get independence, when they get state power. What is it that they do? How do they participate in their own non-viability? You know, um, so we not just simply blame external forces or imperial forces for where we are, but we recognize um, what role do elites play in um, advancing, improving, or reproducing backwardness. So at that time, he's going through some of that, and I happen to um, both he and my then PhD supervisor were working on a, a revolutionary book, and I happened to have been there at that time as a research assistant for them, reading the literature and summarizing and the normal things a research assistant would do. But it had a big impact on my own consciousness and so on, my own development. So that the question of what kind of state should it be a state that will facilitate the private sector in its pursuits? Should it be a state that will seek to discipline the private sector? Should it be a state that will lead, dynamize? Should it be a regulatory state? Should it be, should it be a state that will be activists, getting involved in entrepreneurial activities? These are the kinds of questions that occupy not only scholars, but development practitioners, ministers of finance, and so on and so forth. And you must understand that on that, on these questions, a lot of policies were being formed and framed. And my contribution then to that debate was to look at elements of the developmental state, not to recommend it as a model, but look at a set of tasks that developmental state uh, in all those episodes of long run development um, engaged in. So without going into other discussions, I would just simply say, wind that part of the lecture up by simply saying that I have 20 years on, I am making the point that the, kinds of, the kind of state we need in Barbados is one that would be engaged in heavy doses of coordination. So it's coordination to do with agriculture in the modern sector, coordination to do in relation to the financial sector, coordination 
in sponsoring research and development, encouraging market intelligence, et cetera. I'm arguing that the state has the capacity, and when I say state, I should be careful here. I see the state as a locus, not just of, not just for lawmaking. The state is a locus for policy making, right? The state is also a locus for reimagining futures. You're not going to rely on the private sector to reimagine what kind of social state, social sector we should be developing, what kind of social programs we should be developing. That comes down to the professional class that occupy the public, public service, and it comes down to the political class that occupy the parliament. Altogether, this, these officers map up what we mean by the state. And standing on the shoulders of giants who walk before me, they've argued, this is Caribbean scholars before my generation, have argued consistently that given the different historical and institutional starting points, that is to say slavery and the kind of colonialism we endured, the state has to play a leading catalyzing role in dynamizing, in dynamizing the way forward for economies. 50 to 60 years of statehood is not enough time for us to argue that we, can, that we have a developed private sector that can run with the development man, mantle and, uh, and, and so on. At any rate, the private sector should be left to determine what they do best, which is working on their rate of returns. And the state should act to, facil to facilitate this sort of activity. So we have a number of coordination failures that we need to address. And the coordination failures are part and parcel understood by institutions like the CDB and others as what they call implement implementation deficits, implementation deficit disorders. Uh, a set of, uh, there, there's been some analysis done coming out of these various reports speaking about a malaise and a drift and a, capacity, and, and a failure of capacity on the part of public sectors to be able to implement best laid policies or presumed best laid policies and programs. I, I want to part a little bit from that particular limited conception that seeks to pathologize um, officers of the state to just simply say, our problems are not necessarily in implementation, but in how we coordinate and ensure that we have bureaucracies and public service, public service, a public service that is fit for purpose. So we need more to repurpose the public sector than we need to be speaking about uh, implementation deficit disorders. We have a number of coordination challenges where if we are going to pursue any sustainable development, it means there's going to be need for interagency coordination and engagement with private sector actors as partners, as well as social sector or civil society groups as partners. Now we've heard this before, it's packageable, it's packaged as inclusion and so on and so forth. But the, that kind of packaging leads to gesture politics, where you come up with the ideas, Mr. Government, and then you call in everybody else and pretend to be engaging in some kind of exchange and dialogue. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying the state, if it is going to be a developmental state, has to be engaged in a set of programs and policies where coordination is key. 
So the capacity to coordinate activities, that is to say, organize processes of joint learning among partners and coordinate problem solving among major players in the local economy and society, this is critical. Um, and I'm going to treat to, to three areas. So I'm going to speak to coordination required in the area of agriculture and the rest of the economy, coordination required in relation to tackling our middle income trap. The middle income trap has to do with the fact that we can't borrow internationally at concessionary rates generally because we are having graduated to middle income status and it's something that successive prime ministers, including this one, uh, makes repeatedly at international forum, a point made repeatedly. And I'm also going to talk about coordination to do with seizing opportunities to engage in exports. Now, in relation to agriculture in the modern sector, many economists, when they're writing and talking about agriculture in the modern sector, that modern sector really just simply means broad areas of the economy outside of agriculture where there ought to be some articulation between agricultural policy and other parts of the economy. So agriculture and tourism. I don't need to repeat what's been often said about the need for linkages there. I think we understand that very well. Agriculture and industry, we need to have linkages in relation to um, uh, agro-processing. Um, let's, let's keep it real. If you really want to diversify the Barbados economy, if you want to diversify any Caribbean economy, you've got to find ways to encourage value-added thinking. Everything you do in the economy, every industry, every sector, the state has to coordinate with the players in order to encourage, incentivize them to so do, to engage in value adding activity. Those that will not engage in value added uh, activity will not get the inducements, the tax reliefs, the benefits, and so on. And this is what we talk about when we talk about disciplining capital. You cannot refer to the private sector as if it is a single homogeneous entity. There are many players in there. We don't like to talk, I don't like so much to talk to chambers of commerce as much as we like to talk to chambers of industry. People that are in, 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 are in the business whose daily lives are involved in making and production of things, design, and so on and so forth. They're the ones that will drive the export thrust of the country. They're the ones that um, they may not be involved yet in exports, but they may be making a product and a contribution in the food and beverages sector locally that allows us to have, as consumers, choices. They're the ones that need to be incentivized. They're the ones that need, at this time, that the government is responding to the crisis of runaway cost of living. They're the ones that also need the government to respond in order to help those small business, those small businesses and those that are involved in uh, the production of food, goods, anyone in, that, that, is in, that is engaging in value-added activity needs to be incentivized and so on. I hear about sweetheart arrangements being made with importers and so on, I don't trust them. I'm not saying I don't trust the, whole, the, the wholesalers or the retailers of the country or the bankers or the insurance magnates. I'm not talking about not trusting them in, in the sense of uh, there's no um, malice or no, um, I'm not questioning their business or ethics or anything of that sort. But we know that if you're involved in commerce, then the devil take the hindmost. Let the market deal with the with the capacity of you to survive in the marketplace. No taxpayers' dollars should be spared in saving, popping up, or anything of that sort. Whether small business or large business, I know maybe not for it, but I'm saying 
if a country has to go forward, it has to incentivize certain kinds of activities that will take us forward. Whether it's a large investor or a small business, we have to start making this. We have to start discerning the choices we make. If your sons and daughters are going to start a small business, where um, they're going to import photovoltaics and then install them on the roofs, and you tell me that that's something useful, I will tell you, no, you are not engaging in anything that's value added. But if your son and daughter wants to start a solar water heating or a solar air conditioning company, and you need to import said product in order to facilitate that, then you should see some waivers at the port. Then you should see some duties taken off. In other words, we have to be a little bit more discerning if you're going to be pursuing a true diversification of the economy, and you need a developmental state to do that. You need a developmental state that, that understands that the way forward in the 2030s is to start from now to incentivize those areas, those business, those interests that will be geared towards reducing the import bill or improving exports. In food, fuel, and medicines, these three things occupy our biggest import costs. So we need to be wooing foreign investors in those areas and ranking that foreign direct investment in those areas very highly, while at the same time imposing exacting taxes on those that want to come to buy up property. You understand what I've just said? I've just made a, I've just, because we've lost the capacity to discern in this country, I've just made the point that we do not take up an anti-foreign investment posture. We are not homophobes in Barbados. We are smart. We are saying, if foreign investors can help and assist us in championing the industrial makeover and transformation of this society and economy, you are welcome. Yes, we know that you're here for your return, a return on investment. But as I tell my students every day, if you have someone here to harvest, to come and make the seed and cotton a world leading industry, and you have a foreign investor that's going to line up with a major company like Benetton and take our seed and cotton, and we end up with 30% of the receipts while they end up with 70%. As far as I'm concerned, we move from zero to 30. What we want in relation to that developmental state engaging in bargaining with that foreign direct investor is for, that, is for a, an arrangement where local persons, leaving Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic and other institutions can join that workforce and learn the process. So from the developmental state of the future, what we want is that state to engage in novel bargains. Foreign trade is not just the only bargain there is. You bargain with investors. You try to woo and attract certain kinds of foreign direct investment. And you make it quite clear that the foreign direct investment aimed at catalyzing Barbados' capacity to either engage in import replacement or foreign exchange earning is the kind of foreign direct investment Barbados will welcome and embrace. This reaction to Chinese lending in a very racist, xenophobic way is not the way we should operate. I'm almost embarrassed every time I hear someone making some derogatory remark, whether it's in the Calypso tent or on the floor of, well, or on the airwaves, via brass stacks. Of course, we want to know what are the terms and conditions of the Chinese loans. That's our business. We need to know that. We need to know 
as much about Chinese lending as we need to know about any kind of lending that's done in Barbados. This should be par for the course. This is a kind of transparency that we need. Uh, a kind of transparency where we ask questions, where we routinely get access to information. It doesn't remain in Parliament for, for, for researchers like me to call up the clerk of Parliament to find out what are the terms and conditions of these loans. This should be the fourth estate, the media. You should be able should be able on a regular basis to make for your feature columns and to make for your news. The ability to lay out the term sheet on the conditions of those loans uh, for public consumption. That should be normal. In any functioning democracy, transparency is key and accountability. And we don't need to pass legislation to so achieve that. We just need to ask the citizens for the information. And we must remind the fourth estate of its obligation to serve our democracy better, right? Um, so as I don't get how we how we go straight to criticizing a politician when you have systems and institutions in place that are deliberately avoiding their responsibilities. Right? So you know, you ask what is the role of the media in merely parroting what the minister said, rather than having a future story that is a follow-up to what is being said. So that, for example, the solar, the solar panel um, example I just gave, here's an opportunity for us to reduce our fuel import bill and encourage the growth of wider entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial expression. But why is it today that we are Praising and holding in high esteem a business that wants to import photovoltaics to put on roofs. I don't I don't get that at all. And we have innovators in the field 40, 50 years involving in solar technologies that I'm not seeing being lionized and asked to play a leading role in how we solve some of our solutions, solve some of our problems. But back to the question of how we treat to agriculture and making sure that we have uh, a key, key, making sure the state engages in what I call key coordinated coordination activities. We need the Minister of Agriculture to be involved in horizontal planning and committees that line up with industry, that line up with health, that line up with the tourism, and so on and so forth. Agriculture is not a domain that is to remain within itself. So when we talk about repurposing the public sector in the mode in which East Asian countries and other late-comer develop, developing countries have done, rather than just simply parroting, look what Singapore has done, let's be pragmatic. Can we really talk about food security, food sovereignty, and locate dynamism within how we treat to organizing agriculture through the Ministry of Agriculture? I say no. So let's build on what the current government is doing in this thought experiment that I'm going to engage you with. We have the very good initiative of teaming up with Guyana and approaching a full security program. The challenge I have with it, the only challenge I have with it is the locus or rather the performance metrics that should guide what's happening in relation to the land lease, sorry, to the Lear's project and Guyana's involvement, Guyana and Barbados' um, opportune involvement in raising food sovereignty and food security is that I would like to see a repurposing of the Ministry of Agriculture, whether we ask to perform with a strategic plan that has in it timelines to, for the achievement of certain things so that the people could hold to account 
the rate of progress being made towards food security, and that it not be subject to ministerial pronouncements. So I need to know, for example, what is the plan for the next eight months? How many months we have left in the financial year? Um, you do the math better than me. Uh, between now and April next year. What are the plans that, what do you aim to achieve in relation to this project between now and the next financial year? What are the targets? You know, what, we know what is the baseline. What are the targets? One, what are the strategic linkages with other ministries through which this project and other pre-existing projects, like the Spring Hall and Lease Project and so on, what, in what ways would this uh, help frame extant planning in relation to making inputs in the tourism sector, making inputs in relation to small business or agro-processing? What are the plans? What are the timelines in relation to performance, et cetera, et cetera? You see, whenever the fund comes here or any or the World Bank and they speak about the size of our public sector, they don't understand two things. One, because of the kinds of political economies bequeathed out of that unfortunate slavery and colonial, colonial experience, the state winds up or you, the taxpayers, wind up being the biggest employer of our bright minds. Not the private sector, because the private sector has been acculturated from slavery and colonial times into doing very few things. And it's only of recent that we've seen some dynamism, but we need, as I say, a broader diversification. The economy must reflect a broad domain of economic activities. Right now, we are crumbled small to two or three major activities. That's not enough to excite the fine minds along the vocational and academic and vocational plus academic tracks. Because there are three, vocational, academic, and then there are persons that do the both, do them both. And we can't absorb those fine minds because of the limited scope of our economies. So the state, through tax dollars, has to employ. So if we have large public sectors, that's because of historical and sociological problem issues, uh, reasons. That's not economics. There's no state set out to, to, as it were, uh, run huge deficits with a, with a huge wage bill. That's not irrational. That's rational. They're doing it because until such time as there's a sufficiently broad sectoral development in Barbados, the state has to become and has to play that role of major employer. So you have these fine minds, but you have them functioning as drones doing drudgery. When, the, when that public service should be repurposed to help solve those coordination failures that I spoke about earlier between agriculture and the rest of the economy. And I'm going to say no, because time is going between um, coordinations in relation to the financial sector. Now we know that for businesses to grow, they need access to credit. We had a Barbados Development Bank that played a role in providing some kind of what we could call angel investment, some kind of investment that would assist small entrepreneurs in their pursuits. A decision was made in the wake of neoliberal or IMF council that we should liberalize our banking sector. One of the things we did was we uh, followed the council and advice that the state really should be withdrawing from this kind of activity and allow commercial banks to inform and govern uh, the question of um, uh, loans and so on and so forth to um, entrepreneurs and the rest of it. We, we use for access and so on through the BIDC 
and through other development type agencies to assist, but nothing has replaced the Barbados Development Bank since. Um, and I should tell you that the record on the pages of scholarly journals is clear. You must have a development bank if you're thinking about developmentally transforming your economy and society. It's just, to just pretend that you can avoid it is just a nonsense, a bit of a nonsense. Um, and you're just engaging in ideology and preaching whatever the funds is uh, in relation to allowing market forces and to determine the allocation of resources and finance and so on. I know the theory very well, so if I'm muttering under my breath, forgive me, but I'm, I, do, I'm not, I don't set up straw men to lock them down. I know their argument well that uh, if you prepare the best business prospectus, like bees to honey, the credit bureaus and the banks will rush to you to offer you financing. Um, that there's a, that there's a there's a wash of capital available in the banks. You just don't have a good enough business proposal to woo and attract them. That is that argument. Um, and I'm saying um, the societies that we have inherited, societies where you have, there was no emergence of a black middle class until 1940 and thereabout. A society where we don't have experience of intergenerational wealth among black people. When you have these deep sociological and historical problems, the economics has to bend to accommodate those logics. It's not the other way around. So thanks to Joseph Atherley, I had yet another opportunity um, early, I think last year, to make some points to the fund, Bert and, and everyone else. And um, we had a good discussion. I'm not being facetious in saying that because you have to engage them at the level of their ideas and their assumptions. And once you expose that the assumptions do not align with the circumstance, then there is always that, um, that concession being made by them. But we know, and I really do hope that government advisors are aware that the team that comes, I'm really sure that they're, I'm really sure they're aware that policy is determined by the board of the IMF and not necessarily by the interlopers who come, whether they're the head of the IMF or so. So the team that comes is very much aware, that is to say the team that, that comes all the time, they're very much aware of what is politically feasible and saleable to the board. So that is the frame within which they would engage the Barbados government, regardless of which government it is. That is the frame. And no matter the whistle tour that you give to the head, that person drawn from the World Bank will see like you, but she is still in a learning curve, in learning how to see like the IMF. She came from the World Bank and she has those leanings and they will understand why um, our Prime Minister with those um, social leanings will see eye to eye with the head of the IMF. But the reality is notwithstanding the um, tete, -tete and the and, and, uh, attempts to show you know, what works and what is not working, um, you're not going to get the IMF yielding too much beyond what is politically feasible and saleable to the board of the IMF, right? And, and the attempts to regionalize opposition is a novel one. Um, from my reading on the ground, I think the Barbara's government is doing something novel in trying to regionalize that approach. but my training and instincts are that you will be directed to the World Bank for that special financing to help in those sectors 
because the fund will not assist in that area. Um, if you're going to get, if you're going to use the IMF as a source for support financing because the appetite for buying up government paper remains soft, following the debt rescheduling that, was, that took place back in 2018 to 2020, um, then you need to admit to Barbados that that is the case, that you're really relying on IMF financing where, where it might not otherwise have been, where it might not, where other ministers of finance might have benefited from using Central Bank um, from printing money. Um, I don't think that this government has that fiscal, that has that leverage, sorry. So it does really understand the logjam that our country's in. The logjam is, I mean, if you could just step outside the partisan din, okay? The logjam is after you've done a debt rescheduling, what you've left behind is a fix, but it's a, it has a sort of sting in the tail in that you can't go back now using central bank financing as, is, as in to say, um, issue government paper and have the local institutional and individuals buying up that paper like hotcakes that we were doing pre-2018. That's not going to happen. So this government finds itself in a, in a bind that no other government and no other Ministry of Finance has ever had, which is how does it keep the full gamut of social services going and still rely, uh, how does it keep the full gamut of social services going? How does it try to work towards fiscal surpluses as demanded by the fund? Knowing that you can access central bank financing. And um, the only way around that is perhaps if you engage the fund in a novel way so that you can continue to get a source of financing. And it's a, it's a tricky kind of negotiation going on because the fund, normally you go to the fund when you are facing a balance of payments crisis or when you are approaching a situation where you think your ability to repay debt, that is to say the foreign component of your debt, uh, might be impacted. So you want to unlock the flow of foreign monies, you go to the fund. If you lose invest, investment grade, you also go to the fund uh, in order, again, to unlock a flow of monies. But every time you go to the, to the fund, just know that these, this, this, the very topic that I'm addressing, the need for a developmental state, becomes compromised because the conditionalities lead to what is commonly referred to in the literature and in, and in um, development discourse as a crisis in your policy space. You lose policy space. So from time to time to time, we hear our Prime Minister talking about the need to preserve policy space. But each time you engage the fund, you face the real threat of losing more and more of your policy space. That is to say, your capacity to do things to like, like what has been done recently, um, to do things in terms of providing relief and so on and so forth. But you see, you can provide relief, but you have to make sure while you get it, while you have that relief, you can't go into the new financial year or rather go past the current financial year. So there's a reason why the six months is done. The six months is for the uh, relief package is very useful, but it also is in keeping with how to make the measures that I am introducing politically saleable and feasible to the board of the IMF via the, the traveling, um, the troop of persons who come from the IMF to review your performance, et cetera, et cetera. They will ask questions about the kinds of um, commitments that the state is making in terms of its expenditures. Remember, they're there to tell us, rein in your expenditure to the point that you're running a surplus. 
and not just a surplus, as I've been reading about, a surplus of 6%. And when you get 6%, you got to keep it there. And I said, that is enough to make a society squeal. Couldn't happen on the barrel. Didn't happen under the corn you. It's never happened anywhere. So the IMF has to be challenged ideationally for being wrong-headed. We can't run a fiscal deficit in a small open economy of 6% when we have had the kind of history and the kind of institutional setbacks that this economy and society reflect. We've only had 50, 60 years of independence where we could redirect the path of where we want to go. You can't be coming to this fledgling developing country that hasn't quite yet worked out a broad diversification and tell them run a surplus approaching 6% I keep it there. So every time I hear framers of the BERT policy that's not renewed, keep repeating this thing like a, a reigning faith. I keep asking, wait, are, are, is this kidology? Are they, is this about, you know, saying the thing in public to make Washington feel comfortable? Or is this about really truly believing in that fanciful agreement that you can sustain a fiscal surplus at 6%. Well, I think I, I've always, always said um, that I actually love my prime minister, but I see that my minister of finance is beset with a, a whole set of contradictions. And it has a lot to do with, it, has, it actually has a lot to do, I'm serious, it has a lot to do with the kinds of dilemmas even in the scholarship. Because as I speak to you right now, neoliberal counsel, neoliberal ideas, ideas that come from the fund, continue to experience devastating critique and attack. This is why they're talking more and more about poverty alleviation, about environmental and climate change assistance, and so on and so forth. Because they have, I'm talking about purveyors of neoliberal advice, like the fund of the World Bank, they have a legitimacy crisis to address. And that legitimacy crisis has to do with how are they going to graft recovery, or rather how they're going to graft human development on the on the model of recovery that they're advise, advising. Because in their vision, in their model, the raft of measures that the prime minister put out yesterday will not be in alignment with what the minister of finance is expected to do. Understand where I'm coming from? So. I mean, let's be fair to the Prime Minister. She has to address a set of burning concerns in the country, while also, in her views as Minister of Finance, she has to make an accommodation to the fund. But she has to make this accommodation to the fund because access to central bank financing is no longer a lever to pull. OK? Um, And, the, and, and, and we don't have a level of discourse, an honest discussion among advisors where we could sit down and we could think and debate about the way around this particular kind of, of predicament. So when I talk about coordination failures in relation to the financial sector, we have, apart from financing to do with assisting in small business development and so on, financing to do with how do we finance development comes into the question. How do we finance development? And we're relying on concessionary loans coming from the IMF to get, to get by because 
you can't go on the international capital markets, but you've lost investment grade. But anyway, it was always a bad idea. Even when we had investment grade, you could recall our previous governor of the Central Bank and a previous finance minister expressing about engaging in cold feet behavior when it come when it came to going back out to the capital markets to seek funding because it's always expensive. You got investment grade. It's not as expensive as you don't, but it's still expensive. That's because you've been graduated to a category called middle income. So you can't benefit from concessionary loans at 2 and 3%, 4%. But the IMF lends at that rate. And somebody has to, have, have, well, we have to be reminded that in the era of global finance, a lot has happened since... 2002. This is 2022, and the literature is finding Chinese lending as much more feasible and and uh, less thorny than conditional lending from the IMF. So let me say that again. Accessing Chinese finance matches the concessionary rates of the IMF. So let's be clear. But unlike the IMF, the Chinese do two things. They are patient lenders. The fund is not. We have to start repaying the fund. Right? And they are also lending without conditionalities like we have grown accustomed to that, that impinge on your policy space. We just spoke about policy space. We just said policy space is critical to a developmental state or state interested in bringing about a broad diversification of the economy sufficient enough to sustain its social services that it offers, right? So the Chinese will not tell you don't spend X amount of money on these social measures or these social services. What the Chinese would do, and I want to clarify some myths as a scholar in the area. Let me just clarify some myths, okay? I'm not here to sell anything that China has to offer. Let me just put that as a caveat. I'm here just dealing with what I've been trained to do. I look at international political economy, I, political economy. I look at bargains in the international political economy, what states do, what countries develop, what they don't. That's what I've been publishing about. That's what external reviewers decided to give me a professorship for. Um, what the Chinese seek to do in, in relation to their excess liquidity is to export their, not necessarily unemployment problem, but their economic opportunity challenge. So they will want to have their designers, their, um, as it were, their businesses empowered in the wake of every transaction that is conducted with bilaterals. So they would want Chinese um, firms to be able to get in on the work if it lends money for roads. Getting on the work or getting on the design. Or that, and or some Chinese workers to come and work. Whatever projects that they're involved in, they're interested in having their designers their workers, um, you know, their business persons getting in on the action. Now, you are a sovereign state, just like China. The research, I had something called the UWA, UWI Global Belt and Road Research. And we are about to land a major fund that will look at comparative experiences across Latin America and the Caribbean. 
one of the things, one of the earlier research, early research pieces that we had to do as part of the, making the bid was to look at some of the emerging trains. And would you know what's coming back? Those states that have a clear sense of where they want to go have engaged the Chinese in a very skillful way. Those states that are just simply seeking to address capital needs or the needs for just capital have found themselves engaging in arrangements that the uh, Chinese firms and so on benefit disproportionately. But I have to be very cautious with my language. If you're going to build a road, a major road, you're not going to tell people that the lands contiguous to that road is going to be sold to Chinese developers to build villas and so on and so forth. And then when the road is near completion, you tell the citizens they have to pay a toll tax to travel on that road. That is only setting up a citizenry to respond with outrage. OK? Now I ask, whose fault is that? You are a government. You are a sovereign government. The country I'm speaking about is Jamaica. You cannot, you are going to do that. And then, and I think it was the last government too that paid the price for that, door, for that deal. If you enter into negotiations without being prepared, you will be covered in any sphere. If we enter into relation, into um, negotiations with any country on a trade deal and we are not prepared, we will be covered. You enter into negotiations with a foreign capitalist or foreign investor and you are not clear about what you want, you will be dominated. You enter into a relationship with um, hedge funders, and you're not sure about what you want outside of just a prison, you will end up with an agreement that's neither a lease nor a loan, carrying the vices of both and the virtues of none. The Vico deal that governed the Dodds prison. We have a history of getting into bad arrangements, some good arrangements. Now, if you enter into an arrangement with the Chinese, where you haven't quite Settle for yourself what is it that you need to get developmentally from the Chinese, then that's at you. The next thing is the Chinese are bringing their culture. They're bringing their way of seeing. And just like we have consistently let the British and let the Americans and let the French, we have a history in the Caribbean of railing against racism. We must rail against any form of Chinese racism, too. But you don't say, I am going to turn my back from the possibility of accessing Chinese financing because they are likely to be racist. But you are engaging in, you have been engaging in, in inter imperial relations all your life. Some of it was unequal relations. Some of it have been naive relations. We in the Caribbean, the French, the British, the English, sorry, uh, Americans. And our history is checkered with bad outcomes and sometimes useful outcomes. And we learn from that history. And as we engage the Chinese, we hope our governments seized and armed with that history would know to have the right negotiation team and posture to engage in what is just one of several bargains you engage in as an independent state treating and navigating the global economy. This naive notion that we are to see Chinese lending that the British are, assess are assessing, that the, in that the Americans are assessing. I mean, what do you think Bill Clinton, when he took, when he and Madeleine Albright, a Secretary of State, what do you think they were doing when they said they were going into China to open its economy, even if it means opening up with a crowbar? What do you think they were doing? It was all about business, never mind the rhetoric, because the head of General Motors was right next to them. And I've been to Beijing three times. I see so many American brands in Beijing. 
so many. So let's get real. As you think that the enemy must be, you're determining that the enemy for you is who somebody is tell you should be your enemy. I'm saying to you, the Americans engage them. Germany engages China. And as we speak at the last G7 meeting, they're, they're scrambling, trying to come up with an alternative to the Chinese Belt and Road infrastructure way, uh, uh, initiative way, because 100, listen to this number, 120 countries out of 194 have been I mean, engaging the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. It is a foreign, um, uh, foreign relations success. Uh, it has global impact, 120 countries. But you have to, as a country, determine what is the nature of those negotiations between China and those several countries. If you identify the six or seven that the Center for International, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the research institute, I know them well, coming out of the United States. Oh. Keeps talking about those seven countries that default on debt. You check their history. Maybe because I spent my life in a research institute, it comes to me as easy. You see a story, you investigate behind the story. Zimbabwe, Sri Lanka, as two countries that um, defaulted on their loans with China, has a history of defaults. Nobody's lending to them. And they've all had to rely on IMF support just to unlock funding. So that's not the exemplar that we want to be looking at. And as I had to tell two of my students last academic year, or well, this academic year is winding up, uh, they want to know why they got just less than a... Ronnie, there's this, there's this thing now where the students want, in this grade point average system, an A+, plus, which is like 85%. In our time, you get 70, which was an A, and you're satisfied. The A did the same thing as if you got 90. But grade point average means that you have to, you know, have the metrics adjusted. I assume wrapping up, I'm wrapping up just now. So this student who did this, these two students who did these essays on China Caribbean relations and so on, did good research. But they got an A75, which is not the high A that they want to get this distinction. This is in a master's course. So they came quibbling about the research they did, et cetera, um, about the funding, about um, Chinese, assessing Chinese funding and so on and so forth. And um, I was just able to tell them that the two of the sources that they were checking were sources that if they're read carefully, they'll realize that these are not peer-reviewed or high acclaim sources. These are opinion editorials, just opinions. So you've got a body of work which reflect the research, but you built your essay on the two opinions that were jaundiced, as it were, by us, right? While you had all these scholarly pieces built up as half straw men. So I you got a high mark because I appreciate that you've read widely. But the way you've gone on to, to make the claims. So one of them didn't, one saw the point. I was embarrassed. So I took my A, I gone. The other one had more, had more than an interest and is now a graduate student in our program doing a, a higher degree, a, a PhD. She had more than a passing interest. So she said, I don't see the point and challenge and rest of it. And I was able then to say that, look, um, if we default 
on the VCO deal. That is to say, we as a country are committed to paying for this prison. There are terms and conditions of the use of the prison. I don't know if you all know that. Right, right. That's all right. This is Barbados. You know. There are things that we, we, we are told and there are things we're not always told. Um, you can't build you can't you can't build or add anything to the facility unless you get express permission from the um head, the, the funders and so on and so forth. Um I don't think you could grow food and so on without express permission. There are a number of things and um, ways in which you treat to that because it's a lease, right? Um but I should tell you this. I said to the person, if you if we do not if we default on that then we lose the asset. She said, but I don't get it. How do we lose the asset? It's not like they can take up the prison and walk with it. I said precisely, go and look at the seaports and the airports of those countries where the assets has been quote unquote seized because they've been defaulted. And what would you discover the day it was defaulted, the next morning, the staff came into work and it was business as usual. It's just that the Chinese took over it. But you're never told that. You get the impression that the, the port lies fallow, nobody's in there, and it's a, just a, a white elephant somewhere. That's not true. When it could be Chinese investors or it could be bond investors, it could have been um, let's imagine that the Paradise Hotel was built for season, sorry, was built and whatnot. Let's imagine that was built, but for some reason, uh, it had to be sold. And let's imagine that um, the proceeds of that sale, no, that's not a good example because government was not necessarily involved in buying it up entirely. But if you call, if you call deal is a good one. You use the, the prison, it doesn't mean that we don't have to look to put them at Harrison Point. It doesn't mean that because we default on it, you no longer use it. It just means that the hedge fund operators will probably be asking some local security firm or international security network like G4S to take over the running of the institution and at any rate to function and run it, it has to engage with the Ministry of Home Affairs. So you're back to square one, okay? But it's just that the, the asset no longer, well, the asset was never in your hands. It's just that um, you've defaulted on it. But what happens is your reputation takes a hit. Your reputation with other investors takes a hit, and that is the problem. So for Sri Lanka and Zimbabwe, it was, well, if you could default on a Chinese loan, which is based on patient lending, but I, as a foreign investor, I would not be involving myself in R&D or any real economy investments in your country, I might buy up your land, right? I might build a hotel, but you're not going to find me doing anything other than those kinds of commercial dealing activities. And, um, okay, so, so to wrap up, Fundamentally, just understand that all we face in Barbados and throughout the Caribbean is a set, we are beset by a set of coordination failures and cha well, coordination challenges. Our governments set up after independence mimic the Whitehall Westminster model coming out of Britain. It suited the kinds of structures of our economies at that time because it was only sugar. So just having uh, our public service organized as an army of occupation that Bauer will later call, describe, was good enough for the nature of the economy you had. If you want to diversify your economy, it requires that the state plays a leading role in setting performance targets and coordinating the activities of the state 
with private actors and civil society groups that obviously have interests and so on not in the way in which we know it today under some rubric called the politics of inclusion or inclusionary governance. But the kind of coordination that we're talking about is the very policy framing is done through those horizontal committees. So you don't, you, we are not asked to come and attend a meeting where the policy is in the form of a white paper. We are asked to come and attend the transformation of agriculture in the direction of food security, and we're looking to add value to agriculture. We have between now and March 31st, 2023, to get the first phase going. We've signed agreements with Guyana. We have the land lease, sorry, we have the um, Lears project going on. We have other land lease projects that we lay and follow or in between. And this is where we want to go. You hear from the farmers, you hear from the different interests. You come back again, you say, apart from, we've heard our meeting, apart from where we want to go, we need to achieve this by March. By, the, by March of 2024, we need to achieve the second thing, and you keep going like that. Permanent secretaries get replaced when they don't meet the performance metrics. This is what happens in developmental in countries that has pursued long-run development episodes. You find that the ministries that are at the center of coordinating this activity within an industry take action if there's red tape or delays or procedural blockages. But what we have are states or bureaucracies operating in this in, in this own silo. We have the players in the industry operating in their own silos. Then you have a foreign affairs ministry that engage, engages in foreign trade negotiations without so much a sideways glance at fellow ministries or with players. You invite the players, the players are not trade experts, so they don't know what you're talking about. All they're going to tell you is protect, 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 protect. I need protection. So get everything on liberal on, on those protection timetables. We want a longer time before we liberalize. That's how they can respond. That's the only way they can respond. But a developmental state that centers the coordination of strategic development goals are those that would take up the the overall question of how do we pursue a broader diversification and in accordance with overcoming coloniality and offering our people greater human dignity. It has to be anchored in something. I ain't just pulled that out of the sky. The entire purpose of the revolutions leading up to the end of slavery and colonialism was about the advance of human dignity and was about the about overcoming coloniality in all of its guises. So the same time that we had taken down Nelson, we should have also heard that there's a new factory that is producing cherries to make for the Bayesian cherry drink, not the cherries that now come from Brazil, the pulp. Right? It's just as, that is just as important an element as these symbolic gestures that we engage in. Of course, we want to see Nelson removed. But at the same time, we need to see that, that the broader goals of transforming the society and the economy are being attended to. Because ultimately, we didn't pursue a path of independence to simply repeat the same governance and practices and economic management schedules that the British had left in place. We got it for a particular purpose. So I hope that with these remarks that I was able to inspire you as uh, Steve had asked. Thank you very much.
So what we'll do is take a, a few of them. Tackle those quickly. Okay, um, the mere fact that we are in the midst of a sorry, we remain in the midst of an of a set of crises that are interacting and converging: climate change, uh, the Ukraine war, and the repercussions, um, and. We are also faced with uh, a vaccine pandemic. And all this is having, whether we want to call that globalization or not, all this is having a global impact. I think one of the things that we are faced with in relation to classical globalization, though, is the fact that, I use a term here, financialization. Don't get scared of the word. It's just that we are, we are living in an age where more money can be made in, with capitalists engaging in financial games than in investing in the real economy. So what, is, what I'm really saying is that the real world economy is starved for investment as more and more investors are engaging in stock market trading, engaging in asset purchasing around the world these areas of investment do not necessarily transform uh, societies or economies and what you have is a situation situation where where when capitalists realize that they can get a greater lump of profit by funneling their money through financial channels and not through the real economy of research and development, of plant, of equipment, of skills, and so on, investing in the labor markets, and so on. When you get too much of that happening, you end up with a situation where the world economy is susceptible to the volatility of the casino game. Because we're talking about casino gambling, in a, in a, if you want to use a different term. Anytime you're playing with stocks, anytime you're engaging in real estate prospecting and that kind of thing, and you are, are just engaging in share trading and buying up those kinds of assets and you're making greater money from it as a firm, what you find is that, that you're going to transpose the shocks that come from that sector into the real economy. So the great financial crash of 2008 9 we are at the, some argue that we are at the brink of another kind of crash like that. And capitalism itself was never meant to be without capital, right? And that was the first time in capitalism's long history where you had a squeeze on credit, no available credit. Well, normally, crises in capitalism used to come from a glut or, or overproduction of manufactured goods. In this case, it was money that was toxic in relation to the paper it was written on. Because if you engage in this hyper casino game, you've got, you've, you've got a lot of paper that reflects money or value, but the day that there is a run on that particular asset or company that you are backing, those cluster of companies that you're backing. The day that there's a run, it leads to the falling, falling stock market prices. Your assets that you got locked up in a safe, suddenly that was worth X, suddenly don't worth what party shot at, and you're in a crisis. And like a, a, a deck of cars, it comes crashing down. So 
when people talk about globalization these days, they're talking about financialization to the point where we have um, our financialization, financialization so optimized, it's optimized to the point of maximal vulnerability that 2009 can happen again and worse. Remember, whole economies fell, Iceland and so on, not just titans of business. And then we went into a, a world recession um, that was likened to a global recession because nobody wanted to call it the word. Right? And, and we didn't re quite recover from it, and then we went into a pandemic. And we are seeing the strange behavior, world swings on stock exchanges um, to do with the ebb and flow of um, that um, contagion. Uh, contagion linked to disease, contagion linked to viruses. So whether it's monkeypox or, or so, you've got world fluctuations. So bio, um, biomedical and pharmaceutical companies are great to invest in now. Um, you know, but but then when they become part of a network that is linked to land or is linked to some other asset that is volatile, when that asset collapses, then everything like a pack of cards fall. You just gotta understand the 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 little story about the house that Jack built. This is the house that Jack built, and you realize that when you stack everything on top of that, any event could cause a complete collapse. Credit union. The credit union is stuck where it is because of absence of imagination. Uh, absence of investment imagination. And I say stuck where it is, meaning this. We like our credit union the way it is. Put in some money, borrow much more against it than we can get from a bank. That's fine, but to a point. We can make a decision. We could keep the credit unions the way they are, but stop with this fanciful notion that it can help transform classes of individuals. It's not going to do that. It's going to transform you and so on and so forth, right? Um, we need to think a little bit. We have to recognize that the credit union is there to facilitate a financial need and um, but it will always be faced with pressure to grow its or to accumulate more. I hate to say, but it's re it, it's what we call it, its return on investment has it has to keep an eagle eye on. Don't think that you and me can enter a credit union, borrow three times the amount that we have saved, and that that's a credible model to go on. Because what happens when all of us do it and all of us default? A sufficient combination of us default. So I'm just telling you that when you're involved in these kinds of activities, you want to know that your, your credit union is diversifying the range of investments it's getting into. Not necessarily going, not necessarily jumping on every wave that there is, like cryptocurrencies. But you want to know that it is involving itself in a range of activities, perhaps linked to research and development and experimentation, that, that kind of thing. You know, are you going to put money behind something that is that has been patented, that the market demand is high? What role will the credit union play in putting a set of its money behind XYZ? You know? Um, and then, we, of course, we don't have stock exchanges that are stock exchange um, culture. So some of these publicly listed companies that are otherwise sturdy are not necessarily living uh, or surviving on the basis of um, commercial dealings. Um, if, for example, Solar Dynamics was large enough or Shafet was large enough to be publicly listed you probably would want to make sure that you would you would be happy if you if you hear from your credit union that zero point x percent of some monies will be towards 
uh, the publicly listed effect or the public listed solar dynamics because you can see a market opening up, but they will show you the prospectus, they will show you uh, their AGM, why they made or their quarterly meetings, why they made that kind of investment. You could see there's a turnover that's possible for them. I forgot to tell you, as a critical part of this lecture, I just glanced at my notes. I realized that a critical juncture of this lecture, I wanted to focus, I, I wanted to make the point, apart from repurposing the public sector, also addressing the point about reducing the work week and getting past this notion of a 40 hour work week. Because we are facing a conundrum where which pressure demands may not be met given the exigencies of what's happening, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. And that's about time that we start to look seriously at what the public sector should, elements or aspects of the public sector should look like going forward. Not everybody in, in the public sector should be working um, 40 hours a week, they should receive, they should receive the same pay, but with reduced time so they can engage in some entrepreneurship, family care, and the rest of it. We talk about wanting to put more care into families. We want to, we talk about the need for greater entrepreneurship and so on and so forth. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I gave a talk in Mexico um, at a development conference where I laid out reasons behind pushing past this eight-hour day principle that we've had since the turn of the 20th century, right? This eight-hour day notion, I argue that you can get worker productivity at five and six hours a day anyway, and people need to engage in a little bit more ledger, a little bit more entrepreneurship, a little bit more family time, and that there's nothing stopping great swathes of or, or a large amount of people in the public service working at different shifts, albeit five or six hours a day, for the same pay that you receive. Um, but we're tied to this eight hour day thing and um, part of thinking thinking past the predicaments we face and, and thinking about possible sustainable futures is that we need all those talents in the public service freed up a bit to pursue other activities and they need not be no one person should be there for eight hours. So I'm not in favor of an eight hour work day. It should be reduced. Same pay. Same pay. I'm not touching the pay. But people get mixed up when they say that. It's, um, we are ready to this 40 hour work week. That's not necessary. Yes. Mention. I want to get your thoughts um, on two areas that you mentioned in your delivery. One, because you mentioned Zimbabwe, you mentioned Sri Lanka, in terms of not being able to get funding out of the IMF. No, they defaulted on, on, on loans. They defaulted, on yes. Now, comparatively speaking, Argentina has been defaulting for a lot of years now. Yes. And they've been still getting finance. Yes. I want your thoughts on that as a research person. Yeah, Joe. Uh, you can give me that, but give the other one first, yeah. second one. Yeah. You mentioned something that I it gets under my skin whenever I hear it. And that is in the area of the banking sector. And in relation to, I'm gonna be frank, you may not want to go to the deep politics in terms of a Barbados Labour Party administration. Now, the Barbados Development Bank was established in 1969. It has been, the demise of it came under a Barbados Labour Party or in Alpha. That's one. The Barbados National Bank saw its demise, well, not going out of operation, under a Barbados Labour Party again. Now you have the Prime Minister speaking about she have to look at these fees that the bank are charging and so on. No further comment. Um, ideas crest on wave, you know. Um, during the 
I just want you to know that during the 90s and 2000s, neoliberal ideas as put forward by the IMF held grip and held considerable sway across developing countries, in fact, indeed in the developed world. Sometimes we miss the ideological grip of some of these thoughts. When, when these thoughts become, com these ideas become common sense, then we know the force of the rule that it has over us. Understand me, the idea of liberalization, privatization, deregulation, divestment, state divestment and so on, in Barbados for a long time became kind of a gospel. People were saying that and were not even conscious that they were drinking heavily from the ideological manual or state or manual of statecraft coming from the fund, based on very thinly a very thin uh, amount of empirical evidence. There are no case studies to point out as successful stories about countries doing these things and then engaging in long-run successful development episodes. So Argentina at one point was exposed to child till it defaulted. It started with, the IMF entered Jamaica first in 1977. And what's it now what? Um, where are we? 40 years? No. 45 years later, it's still tinkering with Jamaica, right? Um, but you understand that generations of scholars, trained in economics departments have been imbibing this neoliberal or neoclassical notion of empowering markets, building market orders as the route towards um, successful development. And they go and they teach this. You know, to listen to Kevin Greenwich, for example, is to listen to a student of that thinking. Um, I, I don't criticize Kevin, I just recognize some weaknesses in the arguments because they're steep in ideology. And when you're so ideologically ready to something that it becomes, it takes on the force of common sense. If you then start to engage that person, the person asks you if you're a fool because that's their common sense. Right? Um, so, you know, you were talking about. Yeah, um, so I'm telling you that during that time, Arthur was questing on a wave of prevailing ideas that obtained even the Kayfield School of Economics, Kayfield Department of, Econ of Economics. Understand, I want you to understand something, right? I, because I'm not, I have some deficiencies because I'm not really wedded to the partisan discourse well. So I can have a one or two deficiencies. But understand me when I say this. When the late Prime Minister Arthur is making the points that he's making, he has a background in development economics. You, we have papers at Kfield with him writing. His thought pre-entering politics, is evolving, was evolving, just like mine, mine is, just like any scholars is. When certain ideas hold grip, certain academics hold on to it, see the logic of it, put up papers, etc., and then sometimes change their minds. I'm saying to you, at that time, in 2002, in the early 2000s, when the late Prime Minister was talking about selling the Barbados National Bank and the BDB and whatnot. He did actually believe in the point of the state withdrawing itself from this activity and allow private actors to do what they do best. But by the time he comes to 2008, even before he left office, when he was um, part and parcel of the Economic Partnership Agreement, remember he was talking about the EPA, the EPA, the EPA, and so on. He was already beginning to think about the ways in which the state should find some kind of institution like a bank that could help entrepreneurs. He was a person that introduced special technical assistance programs to the BIDC and, and, and raised it from one million, it was at one or two million, to about five million. In other words, he felt then, oh dear, I have to top up 
the lending assistance that the BIDC would do for small businesses. Why? Because by then, he was beginning to read the criticisms and the backlash of not necessarily what's happening on the ground in terms of DLP politicians opposing, but also what he's reading on the pages of journals. And I could tell you that only because subsequently, when he joined the university, we happened to have adjoining offices. So we would, I want to faithfully report to you that he often was somebody that followed the literature. And if he was persuaded, that was it. You had to bring an argument to tell him otherwise, right? I, that's why I can tell you when he said, let the land, let the, what one of it was, fetch the highest value, that he jokingly told me, you know, Don, I, I must admit that was a fit of rhetorical excess. Because, you know, it was, that's, that's his speech is when he talk about, uh, as a caddy, you'll get more money. You remember that speech? You'll get more money than if you were in the cane field re reaping cane. As a caddy, you'll get 100, 100 US dollars as a tip. I am not entirely vexed with Owen Arthur. And he said it on the Senate floor, and you can see it here. Members and supporters of the Barbados Labour Party destroyed those two institutions. He had no other choice but to close them down. I don't agree. You don't agree? Remember the year before, the year before. I can give you the mic, but I, I don't want to say it to you. I want to say it to you. I want to say it to you. The Barbados National Bank won an award in 1995 for the best bank when it was under government control. All right. <laughs> All right. But I just did it. Okay. Okay. It won. It won. It won. Um, but there was a time when it got it got best bank. Let me, let me get the yeah, there was a time that it got best bank, right? And we were shot as a country when less than two years later, uh, when we got the year wrong. But the, the point is, it had become the best bank. And that was when he saw it as a perfect opportunity to sell because he would get a good bank. So, so I wouldn't say, I would agree that, that, it was, it was, I don't, I don't agree he had no choice. But anyway. Uh, uh, yes, I run. Yes. Um, yes. I, I do believe that any attempt, you know, Everywhere in the United States, let me answer like how I think a Herbara answer, right? Everywhere in the United States, nobody could tell the Treasury, the Secretary of the Treasury, that he can borrow from the Federal Reserve. When in 2008, George Bush, outgoing president, and the newly elected but awaiting inauguration, um, uh, Obama, met to determine what they call the tar targeted, uh, targeted asset relief program, when they more or less decided to bankroll the companies that will be allowed to survive and the banks, because you had a capitalism without credit. Banks ain't had no money. The, the, the money that they had, you know, banks, when you see a bank with money, it's not actually the money in your pocket, you know, is, is a lot of it is on paper and on the computer screen, okay? Um, when that whittles down to nothing because of frenzied behavior and stock exchanges, that screen shows zero, zero or, or nothing. So when they decided to pump money back into the system, 
they had to turn to the Federal Reserve, which is United States Central Bank. And they could do so with confidence, right? Anytime we have lost the capacity to borrow from the Central Bank, it means that we've lost a critical element in the fiscal firepower required to treat the emergencies. Um, the, remember the criticism of the Democratic Liberal Party was they were borrowing from it too much. <laughs> Nuance. They never said don't borrow from the central bank because they were aware that it was being used in their time and that all ministers of finance will raise financing or print money. They call it print money, but it don't mean it's really print money um, to make up for budgetary shortfalls. Every person was aware that you do that. But then we controversially decided to default. Yeah. Then we decided to default on our external debt. And I often like to remind people that our internal debt was a problem. But our external debt was not a problem. What we were faced with was at the end of May 2018, we already back to five or six weeks foreign exchange support. The ideal thing for economists is to have 12 weeks. But you can get hoist on your own petard. You can get carried away with your own rhetoric. It happens to any human being. So if you go about believing that the sky is falling, you've convinced yourself the sky is falling, but you get an opportunity to act you behave that if the sky is indeed going to fall. So we had some commitments that was due in June with Credit Suisse, but rather than meet that commitment with what you had as import cover, we took the decision to default on our external loans as well. And so, I mean, let's be fair, there was a lot of dithering going on under the Democratic Labour Party on the question of engaging in a negotiation with debt holders. And they could have had that negotiation with internal debt holders. And they always have that discussion uh, about debt rescheduling of the internal or the locally denominated debt. But, you know, one seat majorities don't really, I don't wish that any other, in any, any government. Um, so I don't see DLP. I see one seat or two seat majority speaker. It's just one seat. Um, I don't care who it is, wherever it is in the world, you got a one seat, unless it's a situation where you don't meet very regularly in parliament. By the way, I have done some research. We are, we and Trinidad are the most met. <laughs> we go to parliament to conduct the people's affairs on a regular basis. There are some countries in the region that hardly go to Parliament. <laughs> right? So, so the crisis of numbers didn't hit St. Vincent and the Grenadine. Grenadines when they were seven, eight, eight, seven. Right? Yeah, anyway, but the point is, um, so the, the new government then, following White Oak's advice, um, they said about White Oak as a specialist in in debt rescheduling of the external when we needed to, to engage in the internal, in my view. And, um, but the, the point is that the fallout from that is that, you know, your capacity to borrow from the central bank is you can still do it, but the market, because of the terms and conditions of the agreement of the rescheduling, where people something going to wait to 2033 and so on to get their money's locals because in terms of conditions of that agreement, people feel a bit slighted. Um, I remember people seem to have 